number 82, the people of the state of New York versus Sean Garvin. Council. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Tammy Lynn for, uh, of Appellate Advocates for Appellant Sean Garvin. I'd like to reserve one minute for rebuttal, please. One minute? Yes, please. May. Thank you, Your Honor. Welcome. Uh, there are four sound policy reasons for applying Peyton to pre-planned warrantless doorway arrests. First, it would close the loophole to Harris in which this court recognized that police have an incentive to violate Peyton in order to question suspects without counsel. Second, treating someone who opens the door the same as someone who invites the police inside would equate a submission to authority with consent, which is inconsistent with this court's decision in Gonzalez. Third, and similarly, we shouldn't protect the Fourth Amendment rights of those who are willing to ignore the, of only those who are willing to ignore the police or close the door in an officer's face. And fourth, assessing the purpose of an intrusion serves the Fourth Amendment goal of preventing unreasonable searches and seizures and is fairer than hinging constitutional rights on the definition of a doorway. Is it unreasonable for the police to approach someone's door, knock on the door, and wait for them to open the door? And it's not unreasonable to approach a knock on a door just the way that any civilian could do, um, approach a house. It is unreasonable if the purpose is to get someone to open the door where they're almost always going to submit to authority. They see a police officer outside, they're going to open the door, and then they're subject to arrest just by that sheer fact alone. So if you have probable cause, you can't knock on the door? That would be the rule? You can knock on the door, but I guess you shouldn't go and arrest them without a warrant under the rule that I'm asking for. Um, in terms of the Harris analysis, it seems to me it would be extending that analysis a bit farther because Harris was concerned on a state constitutional ground with going inside this house or apartment without a warrant. You get a statement, sorry, the arrest is bad on the Fourth Amendment, but we get to keep the statement. But here, I mean, if they wait outside the house till he comes out with the same intent, you wouldn't suppress the statement, right? Yeah, you can have a public arrest. So the police could certainly go outside and, or come to someone's house and just wait outside for him to enter. Um, but Harris wasn't only about going inside the home. Harris was about preventing police from trying to avoid the right to counsel attaching. That is the but underlying. you could do that by waiting outside the house, right? You could. And they're certainly free to do that. I'm just arguing that they shouldn't be able to go and essentially coerce someone to come outside. But it's kind of a bootstrap argument in a way, right? Because Harris found the Peyton violation. There was no question in Harris, the Harris application in, uh, of Peyton was the Peyton violation was found by the Supreme Court and then we were applying attenuation in, in Harris. So you already had a, so the question really for us here is, is there a Peyton violation? Because if being on the doorsteps, kind of like being outside on the porch or being on the sidewalk waiting, there really is no Harris issue, right? I think that the, rele the facts of the case really show that it's kind of a combined problem. What happened here is that the police could have very well sat outside Mr. Garvin's apartment and waited for him to leave. But instead, they went and got him to come outside just so that they could coordinate the timing of his arrest with tricking his girlfriend to come to the precinct and then use her presence there against him to coerce his confession. So Are that's the problem. Are you making a state constitutional argument? I'm sorry? Are you making a state constitutional argument or just a federal argument? I'm both. I'm saying and that. that was, you did that below? Uh, I don't believe that Allen had been decided below, um, but I know that defense counsel at the, tr so I'm asking this court to adopt the rule in Allen. But that's which, a federal rule, right? Which is a federal rule. And, um, and, and, and um, we recently in Spencer just relied on Reynoso, right? And, and so why, why would we um, now change course um, based on Allen, and which is certainly not universally accepted even in the federal courts. Sure, yeah. Well, two things. First of all, Spencer didn't seem to discuss Reno, so it just said there was record support for the lower court's finding that this was a threshold or a, not a violation of Peyton. Well, I think impl Im implicitly, implicitly, yes, it's right? following Reynoso. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think that you need to overrule Reynoso to follow Allen, because Reynoso was really about whether the doorway itself was part of the home. It was a 
question about you know, the physical aspects of the home, and I'm saying that you should be looking at the purpose of why the police went to the home if it was to violate Peyton and circumvent the right to counsel. Well, so in that the, sense, it's... I mean, what's the evidence in this record uh, uh, with the findings of fact made by the appellate division that that's why they went there? Uh, we're going to violate Peyton. Uh, the appellate division, I don't believe, addressed that the lower court defense counsel argued that the police went to violate Peyton to circumvent the right to counsel, that Mr. Garvin never left his home. Uh, that I thought they were looking for his girlfriend when they went there. They initially asked for his girlfriend, but and they... Then, and then when she wasn't there, they left. But they also testified that they went there to arrest him. Wasn't they, that the directive? That, yes, they that were directed the there to Go arrest... Go to that house and arrest him. Absolutely. And they showed him a picture I mean, that, of the defendant. They Did they not show a picture of the defendant? Absolutely. Thank you. So yeah, they, that was they the could, sole they could circumvent the right to counsel the same way by waiting on the street, right? So I take it that your argument is they wouldn't actually do that because it's so much more efficient to go knock on the door than wait on the street for hours and hours, which would yes. force them to get a warrant. Is that what you're saying? Yes, they'd have a lot harder time. So doesn't your rule then sort of force the you know, factual disputes that occur about was somebody inside their door or on the threshold or just outside or they stuck their head outside or whatever, that dispute that we're getting, we've gotten in lots of cases, to uh, I think your rule said uh, whether this was a planned arrest, so now there's going to be factual disputes about whether it was pre-planned or not planned, um, right? And, and um, whether, of course, there's exigent circumstances, because I assume your rule would say if there's exigent circumstances, they can go in. Uh, yes, exigent circumstances would certainly justify. Are we just going to have a different set of fact disputes? I think it's kind of unavoidable. Uh, suppression hearings often turn, or so always why is, turn why on is the rule facts. Better? I think it's because of the policy reasons that I laid out, because of Harris, because of the facts showing that this was an attempt to try to <coughs> get around the right to counsel and question. But I guess the difficulty is, where's the line? That's, that's really the difficulty, Judge, Judge Wilson just hit on it. I mean, what, what, what's our basis for drawing the line, a foot here or a foot there? Well, so I was going to move to that and say it's also, it seems to be more in line with the purpose of the Fourth Amendment to prevent unreasonable searches and seizures, to look at the purpose of what the police were doing than to focus on whether someone was on their door sill or out right in front of it or right behind, of it, behind it and still inside their home. And in fact, the arresting officer testified here that both he and my client were on the, in the doorway, which was physically impossible. And he said that my client and others who were indisputably inside the apartment oh, so, so were what, at the doorway. What is the actual factual finding by the appellate division? Because the Supreme Court says he's outside. All right. Clearly, I don't think when you read the appellate division uh, decision, that's what they're saying. Uh, so what is the factual finding as to where the defendant is, where the police is at the time he's arrested? I believe that the appellate division found that a doorway arrest was fine and that he was in his doorway. Uh, but this court isn't bound by the appellate division's factual well, determination. Uh, really? Uh, we're not bound by their factual findings? We look back to the record whether there's factual support for their determination. And here there was no factual support to say that Mr. Garvin ever stepped beyond his threshold. Because of the ambiguity in the arresting officer's testimony about whether he was actually on his doorstep or beyond it, I don't think that there's any record support to show that he wasn't actually in ins inside his apartment. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Ben? Good afternoon, Danielle Fenn for respondent. May it please the court. Here, defendant's threshold arrest was proper and complied with Payton. So, so when the officer is instructed to go uh, to the address and arrest the defendant, was, was that an instruction to wait outside until the defendant comes out? What, what exactly did that mean? Um, the testimony was the detective Shore told the detective, the arresting detective, detect Detective Weatherly, to go arrest defendant. Yes. So the, but given there's no arrest warrant, what, what did that mean? Um, the direction was to arrest him. They decided to then enter the house and make a warrantless arrest, which complied with both this court's ruling in Reynoso and the Supreme Court. Well, you just cases. said entered the house. Did they actually enter the house? They entered <clears> the, the front door. They never entered the apartment. They entered the front door. There was a vestibule and a hallway. They proceeded up the hallway. The defendant was the second floor apartment. Well, wasn't that the basis the of the dissent, the appellate division, that they didn't have the authority? This is a two-story house, a two-apartment house, right? It's like a double. And uh, um, so 
the question for us is, I suppose, is the doorway in a two-story uh, uh, double home the same as a porch in a single home? Um, no, Your Honor. And for, first, this um, you're correct. That was the issue that the dissenting judge mm -hmm. had. Um, this claim is unpreserved. Um, defendant never argued this below. He never but said you see, that. You see the problem with the language. There's, it's, it's difficult to distinguish phrases like in the doorway, inside the doorway, at the doorway. One could argue they each mean different things. Yes, Your Honor. And th in this case, there, there's two issues. Um, the dissent in the appellate division um, had an issue with the initial entry in the front door of the mm -hmm. two-family house. And then there's the issue of the threshold arrest, the testimony the way about I that. understood the dissent is she was saying you shouldn't have been in the house at all. You had no right to be in the house at all. Yes, the dissent found um, a, a problem with that initial entry through the front door before they got through the vestibule and then up the staircase. Um, first, this claim is unpreserved. And moreover, defendant failed to show a legitimate expectation of privacy in that area that he's now challenging, the vestibule and um, the, the staircase outside his apartment. How is um, that? It's a, it's a two-family house. Yes. How, how, how would he not have some privacy interests in the staircase leading up to his apartment door. Defendant did not um, establish that this legitimate expectation of privacy. First of all, he didn't have exclusive control. It was shared with the first floor tenant. Um, and there's no testimony of personal items. Well, the in first the floor tenant or, was not home, correct? There, there wasn't testimony. I mean, because the officers don't clear. even remember how they got in, correct? It wasn't clear. Um, the testimony. So, so there's not consent from that first floor, floor tenant right, to go up no, the staircase and no. come in the house and do all of this, correct? Not at all, Your Honor. There's no real testimony about whether they talked to her or not. The so then said, behind that, front, that very front door that the officers don't understand why it's miraculously open or can't remember, can't recall, um, behind that, is that private, their private home of the people who live in this two-family home? No, Your Honor. This defendant What if it's an official two-family, a formal two-family home under the law, but they use it like a one-family? The defendant's living space, where he has a legitimate expectation of privacy that the Fourth Amendment protects, is his home, and that's his apartment. What if it's this somebody's mother-in-law or somebody's adult daughter? Does it, are we going to have to investigate who lives in it to determine whether there's an expectation of privacy? No, Your Honor. For this issue about the vestibule and the staircase, um, this defendant, the, the evidence does not show that he had an Whose expectation burden of, of proof privacy. is it on that issue? It's the people's burden to go forward with the legality of the police conduct, but it's the defendant's burden to show that he has a legitimate expectation of privacy in which he make area. Did the defendant make any specific allegations as to his privacy interest in what you call the vestibule or the hallway? No, Your Honor. He did not at the hearing. And, and the, isn't the really point isn't the point whether that's, that is obvious and inherent in the fact that it's a two-family house, that behind the front door to get in the building is the private space of these inhabitants. No, Your Honor. In this case, the protected Fourth Amendment area is the home, the apartment. Here, this vestibule was um, someplace where you didn't okay, have Okay, so if I'm walking down the street and someone has their front door open, I can just go up and down the staircase? In this case, um, the, the issue isn't whether anyone could enter. It, it seems like they were able to enter. The, the testimony is a little unclear how the police got in. No, yes, they don't remember. No, I understand. They, that, yeah. He said they don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no ability to. Which must mean they don't have consent, right? They don't remember anyone giving them consent or saying, please go up the staircase. So that's okay correct. With me. What's wrong Th that's with the rule that no says you have to get a warrant? I'm sorry? What's wrong with the rule proposed by counsel that says if this is not an exigent circumstance and if it's a pre planned arrest, you should go get a warrant? In this case, um, uh, I'm not asking was, about this case. Generally, what what would be wrong with a rule like that? In generally, um, the court courts, this court, the Supreme Court, has said that these threshold arrests are comply with the Fourth Amendment. Um, in this case. The, the police could have gotten a warrant. It could have taken an extra amount of time. Um, there were exigent circumstances, and they needed to act quickly. What, what were and in the fact, exigent circumstances, and where is that in the record? Um, it's um, supported by the record. First of all, there's, there's several factors. There's the gravity of the 
the offense, there was a strong showing of probable cause, and there was an increasing danger that defendant might flee or destroy evidence. But um, neither the Supreme Court nor the appellate division actually made a finding of exigent circumstances, did they? That's correct. The, um, the uh, Supreme Court said if that. I could just take you to a different issue. So when you, let's, let's say we have to decide this based on what happens when they get upstairs at that threshold. At what point is he under arrest? Is he under arrest when the police say, we're here to arrest you? Is he under arrest when the cops put, a, uh, the police officer put uh, the cuffs on him? Uh, at what point is he under arrest? When he turns around, because uh, he turns around and submits? Um, in this case, it's, such a short period of time. The testimony is that the detective knocked on the door, defendant opened it, he said, you're under arrest, and then turned around and put his handcuffs on. At that point, he, of course, wasn't free to leave. And he submitted, he knowingly submitted to the police authority when, at that So point. you're saying it's when he puts the, the cuffs on, when the arresting officer puts the cuffs on? Or when he says, you're, you're under, under arrest. arrest. At that point. So when he says, you're under arrest, where is the defendant on this record as uh, the findings of facts are made by the appellate division? The testimony is that it was a doorway at threshold What did arrest. the appellate division find as to where, he, what can we read from their decision as to where he's standing? In the doorway. Didn't they say outside? More important to my mind, where was the police officer? He was always in the hallway. The testimony was consistent that he was always in the hallway, defendant was in the doorway of the threshold, and the police complied with Payton and never entered the apartment. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Council? Um, I'm going to try to run through a few things very quickly. As for the uh, initial entry issue, it was absolutely preserved. Defense counsel urged the suppression, the hearing court, to look very carefully at how the police entered the building at the outset, that they couldn't remember whether they were buzzed in or spoke to anyone. I believe that was more than enough to bring the issue to the court's attention. Uh, as for the privacy of the stairwell, a subjective expectation of privacy. It's true that the defense has the general burden of coming forward to show that, but societal norms are always relevant as well. Uh, the Supreme Court how, has said that. How is this distinguishable from Hansen? I think in Hansen there was actually testimony that the door to the two-family home was left unlocked and that people were free <clears throat> to come and go as they pleased. So I think that was a little bit different. Um, here there was nothing like that. And so we actually have no idea whether the front door was locked because the police officer couldn't remember. So, so let me just ask you this. If we focus on where the, the, uh, the police are, uh, as the chief judge's question uh, to the prosecution asked, um, don't you lose? If we focus on where the police are? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, with all due respect. I, mean, I understand that Alan uh, focuses on where the defendant is. But uh, if you focus on where the police is, are uh, and, and the state cases, uh, I would how, say, how do you win? I would say it's not really the location of the defendant that matters, and that's not how I read Allen. I read Allen as saying that when the police go to someone's home with the intention of essentially coercing them to come outside, it may not have dragged him out, it may not have used a bullhorn like some of the cases, but it's a show of authority that someone submits to. They open their door, and like she said, he's under arrest the minute that he opens so the door. So now it's their intention, it's not whether they actually did coerce or... Whether the purpose was to go and make a pre-planned warrantless arrest, especially if the surrounding factors look like it's intended so if, to... So if they get to the door and they, you're under arrest, he steps back, he closes the door, could he have done that? No. Would that have given them exigent circumstances to now go in? It seems like they would be able to go in because he's under arrest and they have every right so to So is there anything him. he could have done once they get to that door? Let's say they're at the bottom of the staircase. Put, forget that they're in front of the door. At the bottom of the staircase, they call out, he opens the door, and they say, you're under arrest. There's nothing he could have done. He would have been ignoring a direct order that he was under arrest. He would have just been in more he trouble resisting arrest, He couldn't have stepped back and closed the door? He couldn't have stepped back and closed the door? He could have, but he would have been resisting arrest at that point. So resisting I Resisting arrest? Wouldn't he if he was told he's under arrest, and then he slams the door in the officer's face and says, I'm not coming with you? It doesn't seem like it would go physical, well for him. You don't you? So, so, sorry. Um, well, under our case law, would that have presented perhaps exigent circumstances for the police to act if they don't know if he's going to try and escape? I think it seems like it very well could have. And so he's really in a catch-22 at that point. And I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. You don't want to encourage people to have to shut the door in a police officer's face. And those are the only people to get protected. The, as just, uh, 
Judge DeFiori mentioned before, the police have every right to approach someone's door, to talk to them, even if they have probable cause, if they want to continue their investigation. We should encourage people to cooperate. And this rule, the rule I'm proposing, encourages people to cooperate. Um, I also want to very pre I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to address a couple other things, if that's okay, that uh, my co uh, opposing counsel brought up. <laughs> Um, the Supreme Court has never approved a threshold arrest like this. The only case that addresses it is Santana. That was a hot pursuit case. It was completely different. She was standing in her doorway when the police arrived, holding something that they thought was drugs based on her previous criminal activity. There also was no exigency here. Although, although um, Kentucky versus King certainly suggests that, that the Supreme Court would sanction this. Kentucky versus King says that you can knock, but it doesn't so you can knock and it says that 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 the the home the person who lives there has every right to ignore it and and every right to stand on on their constitutional rights well you do definitely have a right to ignore it i'm just saying we don't want people to ignore the police when they knock um and thank it you does, counsel oh, thank you your honor you're welcome